Welcome to our cottage garden and today we wanted to do a complete tour of the garden just so you have a sense of the layout, what our plans are and what we've been working on so far. So a little bit of context for you, our cottage is about 250 years old, we've lived here for three years and when we moved in there wasn't a lot going on in the garden so pretty much everything that I'm going to show you we've done ourselves over the last three years. Um, we were really lucky that there's some mature trees in the garden, so I can show you those too. Obviously, they've been here since we moved in. Um, so let's get going. So this is the back of our house here, and we've got this strange um, kind of part rockery, part staircase, part wall. Um, so this is our wash house, and on the edge here I've grown um, a Clematis Montana. And um, I started this two and a half years ago and it's now covering most of the wall and I'm pretty sure by the end of this season it will have grown across the whole thing and I'll have a job keeping it in check but in spring this looks really really amazing it's just finished flowering now um, but in spring it's just a mass of pink flowers and it adds a lot of life to what otherwise would be quite a grey and bare area um, it's also really nice just against the backdrop of this stone um, it's just lovely rustic beautiful kind of spring setting. Um, so let's go up the steps slightly and I'll show you the next part of this garden. In this part of the garden, we've got a small bed here and some lovely steps leading up to the main garden. And what I wanted to achieve here was a kind of overgrown wild fairy tale sort of look. Um, so I have sown erigeron seeds absolutely everywhere. That's this tiny um, daisy looking flower that's be below me. Um, I started doing this about two years ago. And again, my intention is just to completely cover this area. And the good thing about erigeron is it has a really long flowering season. So we're at the end of May now. It started flowering about a week ago and we'll have months more of this flowering. And then it dies back somewhat in the winter. So you can see the steps again. So overall, it feels like we have a really nice balance of being able to see like the architecture of this bit of the garden, but also covering it in flowers. I've also started a herb garden here. Um, this bit of the garden is very close to our kitchen. We're about three meters away from our kitchen. So I thought it would be really nice to grow things that I can use for either seasoning our food or for tea. So I've got some thyme, some rosemary and some mint at the bottom there. Um, I love mint tea. So once the mint has taken over that part of the bed, I'll be able to come out here and get some ingredients for my tea. We've also got lavender. Um, the lavender was here when we moved in. So it's a bit leggy and out of shape. We're not sure whether we're gonna keep it or not, but for now it's a nice thing to have. And then on the other side of me, uh, we grow strawberries here. And the reason we grow the strawberries here is because it's the area of the garden with fewer mice. Um, when we grow them at the top of the garden, we don't get so many of them because the mice just eat them as soon as they ripen. But down here, there aren't really many mice. Um, and if there are, our dogs will chase them away. So this is a really good place for us to grow strawberries and make sure we have a good harvest from them. And then behind me, this is a Wisteria Alba Floribunda. Um, I need to give it a little bit of a trim, but this is something I planted about three years ago when we moved in. And I want to keep it small, um, but it would be really, really great if it hasn't flowered yet, um, but maybe next year it will flower. We'll see how we go. I just want to have sort of little waterfall of white Wisteria along the edge of this wall. Um, We'll see how it goes. It might be that it's not getting enough sunlight, but I will just continue to train it closer to the sunlight if that's the case. We'll find a way of making it work. But you can see it, uh, it's putting on a lot of growth. So I think I need to keep that one uh, a little bit under control. So that's something that I'll be doing soon. But that is uh, more or less an intro to this part of the garden, which we don't show you very much because it doesn't change very often, but it's still really, really lovely walkway into the main garden. So now let's continue up the steps and I'll show you our first bit of lawn. This is our first bit of lawn and I should mention at this point, the garden is about 300, 350 foot long and it's divided up into lots of little sections, which makes it really easy to garden and think about what kind of colors we want in which section and kind of how we want it to feel. So in this area, we have a pond to the right of me and this pond was here when we moved in. However, it was completely full with an invasive type of uh, water iris and I tried to pull them out myself. It was completely full, um, very little water in there because the roots were about this deep, a big kind of tangle of roots. So I bought some waders, climbed into the pond, tried to pull them out myself, but it was just too heavy. In the end, we had to get help from a landscaper and they kind of built like a small crane out of um, a pulley system out of rope um, in the tree, tied it around the uh, root balls, used 
like an axe or a saw to cut them up into smaller pieces and then pulled them out. So now we have a clean slate for the pond, but we haven't got around to doing anything with it. And we also encountered a problem where when they were removing the invasive iris, they punctured the lining. Um, and so now the pond doesn't fully fill. So what we're going to have to do with this area when we get around to it is completely start again. Um, but luckily it will be much easier now that that iris is gone because it was really, really full. And I think this will be super lovely um, once we can spend some time and money working on it. But that's uh, a project that is uh, going to happen later down the line. And it's definitely not a priority for us, but it's something that we uh, are interested in doing. And then in the rest of this garden, um, the borders aren't really finished, um, but I grow a lot of roses in this area. So I've got probably about seven rose plants here, a magnolia tree, a couple of bulbs. Um, but this is an area where the dogs spend a lot of time. So it's not the most perfect of gardens, but I wanted to show you just so that you can see everything and get a sense of what the space is like. So now let's move into the next lawn behind me. This is our second bit of lawn. And at the moment, it doesn't look like there's a lot going on here, but this is uh, more of a winter garden. So I grow crocuses in the lawn here. And initially I planted about 800 bulbs. That was two or three years ago and they spread. And they are a type of crocus called Pickwick with a really lovely, massive purple flower. And they just completely carpet this lawn in winter. And it's a really, really nice reward for getting through the winter months. Um, and that was the reason I did it. So. We let the bulbs rest, we let the grass grow long. Sometimes we do no mow may here. In the spring, it doesn't look particularly exciting, but it's just something that we think of as a winter garden. And then the borders on the sides, we've got um, a few plum trees that were here when we moved in. And over time, the plum trees have self-seeded. So I would say there's actually quite a lot. There could be about between 10 and 20 plum trees in this area. Um, most of them are big enough that we do get a, a really good supply of plums in the summer. Sometimes we struggle with um, I think, I can't remember the precise name of the creature, but it's some sort of plum moth that lays its eggs in there. Uh, it means you can't really eat the plums because the larvae will be in there. So we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that we're not struggling with that this year. We are lucky we have quite a good bat population in the garden and hopefully those will eat the moths and help us keep that under control. So we'll see how we go this summer. Um, as for the borders around the plum trees though, this is an area that we're currently sort of clearing and there are a few projects that I've started. So I have started a rose, a rose hedge against the edge of the pond, which isn't flowering yet, but it has lots of buds on there. And I'm using um, a David Austin rose, which one am I using? I'm using a rose uh, by David Austin called Emily Bronte. And I think I've planted about five of those in a line. So that should form a really, really lovely rose hedge. Um, just so we've got something for the summer months in this part of the garden. On the other side of me in these borders, we inherited some really, really lovely um, older shrubs. So they're taking up a lot of space. And um, we've got a box hedge here. Unfortunately, we do struggle with box blight now. So we just kind of try to cut that out when we see it emerging in the summer um, and then leave the hedges in the winter just so it doesn't spread. Um, but I think eventually we will have to take our box hedges out, which is a shame because we have a lot of huge ones. Um, and it obviously would take a long time to grow something to fill its space. And we're not entirely sure what we want to replace them with either. Ideally, some sort of hedge that we can uh, clip into a spherical sort of shape in the same way. But there's just something about box. The colour is just so much nicer than things like you, in my opinion, where the, the green is like a bit more muted. I love this like fresh, uh, pale green growth that you get on box in the spring. So that's something that we again will have to deal with down the line, but it's not a priority right now. We're just kind of trying to maintain them and keep them here as long as we can. Um, we've also got a hydrangea and I grow a lot of hellebores here. So again, this is more of a winter area of interest. Um, we've got some really, really beautiful hellebores that are kind of pale pink uh, in this area. And then behind me, you can see some of the structures that we inherited in this garden. We have rebuilt um, most of them. So we've got a duck shed, which is the building closest to you right now. It used to be a pigsty um, and the idea was before these gardens were divided, they were sort of like a community farm and the neighbors would have uh, shared the land and raise animals, livestock um, and grown food, um, which is really cool, but not how it's done now. So we inherited the pigsty in our garden. And um, when we moved in, it was falling apart. So we had to get the roof completely rebuilt and rebuild the back slightly as well. Uh, we keep our ducks in there now and we've had to fox proof it and um, kind of build a massive cage off the side of it because we do struggle with foxes, but it looks a lot better now. 
And then we also have a potting shed, which we will get to in a minute, but that was another thing that we uh, had to rebuild ourselves because it was completely falling apart when we moved in and the roof was at risk of falling down on us, which we didn't realise at the time. So let's move uh, closer to those structures in the garden and I'll show you around. This is the middle of our garden and you can see and probably hear our ducks behind me, which we've had to build an enclosure for to um, keep the foxes out. Um, you can also see the potting shed behind me, which our friend helped us build. So when we moved in, it was uh, much smaller. The foundations were still the same, but the wood was all rotten, the roof was falling in. So we had to completely uh, deconstruct it. And then our friend helped us build this really, really lovely shed, which we're really happy with. We love the shape of the windows and how they're kind of arched. And it's just a really sweet, bespoke kind of shed that I don't think you see uh, too often. So we're super happy with that. And uh, we use that to sow our seeds. We use it to store pots and garden tools. And uh, we use it in, as sort of a greenhouse as well, because the uh, temperature in there is really warm and you do get a lot of light through the windows. So it's super handy to have. And then in this area of the garden, we've got a lot of open space and we use this as kind of a mini meadow. So we don't mow the lawn and you can see to the side of me, there's a lot of daisies, cow parsley. We grow some daffodils in there, primroses, all sorts of things and wildflowers. Um, so it's a really good area for the pollinators. We get a lot of like beetles and insects and bees. Um, and we also leave, we deliberately leave mess around the garden. So like piles of logs, piles of tiles, things where um, insects can hibernate or hide or live. And, um, is something that's paid off and I think it's a really good approach to gardening to like embrace things that you might think of as weeds, embrace a little bit of mess um, and it's just a much more kind of nature friendly way of gardening and it's easier too because you mow the lawn less and you can be a bit messier. In front of me is our mini meadow which you can see has uh, loads of clover and cow parsley flowering at the moment and then behind me is our large greenhouse which again was something that was here when we moved in. Um, it was I would say overgrown with agave plants and they're really, really amazing. But what's happened uh, was each time the agave plant has had a child, it hasn't been lifted out and it's grown into a full size agave plant and they were everywhere. Um, so we've gradually been trying to dig them out and finding a new home. So some of them have gone to my sister's house. Some of them have gone inside. Most of them are still in there. Um, we want to try and keep a couple of the really big ones, um, but we kind of want to turn it into a more usable space where we can grow things like tomatoes. Um, I've put a peach tree in there. Um, so let's go in and I'll show you what it looks like at the moment. So you'll have to think of this as a work in progress, but you can see to the side of me, there are some really, really amazing cacti and agaves. And this isn't a heated greenhouse, um, so it does get quite cold in the winter. It gets the edge of the frost, but things don't really fully frost in here, which is why a lot of the cacti have survived. However, um, there are also a lot of dead cacti, which were, they look like they weren't cold hardy varieties. So the ones that have survived are um, the agaves. There was a huge prickly pear um, that I kept trying to cut down and every time I cut it down, it would regrow. Um, so I've got most of the remnants of that prickly pear in pots on the floor to the side of me. Um, but I did put this project on pause because last year when I was working on it, um, there's a nest of false widow spiders in here and I got bitten by one and I had a really bad reaction to it and it just put me off working in this space for a while. Um, so what I instead started doing was adding things in rather than working on removing things because um, you can see the left side of me is quite empty and it does have a lot of space. So behind me is the peach tree that I added in and I've also added in um, a goji berry bush and some chamomile plants and at the moment I'm adding things in that won't need pollinating because <laughs> you might notice the windows are so high up that I can't reach them and I need to add some grip so that I can leave the doors open in the day for the pollinators to get in. So um, for the meantime I've just got things in here that don't need pollinators but as we progress forward hopefully this will be um, full of like fruit trees, perennial um, edible plants and things that will allow pollinators to come in and enjoy the space as well. Because although we love the agaves, they are just so overgrown. Um, if we do want to keep them, I think we'd have to tidy them up and kind of restart this space. And they're not really a plant that interests me um, in the way that I know some other people love them. So I think it would be better if we just dig them out and find better homes for them. But um, someone clearly loved them here once and did an amazing job of this space. It's just that it hasn't been maintained. So. We've also got a few windows that have smashed that we need to fix. Um, there weren't actually any smashed when we moved in, but our neighbor smashed them and now we've got to repair them. So 
Uh, and then obviously there is a lot of weeding to do around here. But I think the really cool thing about this greenhouse is that it's been sunk into the ground. So um, it's probably sunk by about half a metre, I would say, um, which led us to think maybe it would be a really cool, like natural swimming pool kind of space. Obviously it would need a lot of work to get to that point, but it would mean that the greenhouse can um, help keep the warmth in. And um, I've seen some really, really amazing like natural ponds where there are um, plants that help oxygenate the water and keep it clean um, and you can still swim in them. And that's definitely something that we thought about doing, but at the moment time and money don't allow for it, but maybe one day or whoever moves in here in the future, maybe that's something they'll want to do with this space. Uh, but for the minute, we're gonna just work on turning it into a greenhouse for growing food. So let's continue uh, looking around the rest of the garden. Now to either side of me, um, there are a couple of borders that I will probably show you the most in my YouTube videos because they get the most light. So we can grow lots of really lovely flowers here and it seems like there's always something flowering. Um, at the moment we're in late May, so we're kind of leaning towards that gap before things like roses and dahlias and annuals start flowering. Um, so we've got the last of our kind of um, late spring flowers coming up, early summer flowers. Um, we've got these alliums, which I added last year. Um, I've never seen them flower before, so that's really cool. They look amazing. Um, still a bit early for them to be in full bloom, but lots of promise there. And I'm glad to see they've all come up because I know the ducks were trampling on them a little bit. Um, we've also got a lot of irises. So we have loads of Dutch iris here. These ones are called Silver Beauty. And then there's some white Dutch iris as well. And also we have some, um, irises behind me that are called Jane Phillips and I planted those about three years ago when we moved in and this is the first year they flowered and there's a lot of kind of like long long term rewards in the garden that are similar to that so I added a lot of peonies and this is the first year that I'm seeing them flower after waiting for three years so it feels like things are finally starting to come together and although we've still got loads that we want to do it's nice to finally reap the rewards because it feels like we've been working quite hard for three years. Um, the other thing in this bed at the moment that's not quite in flower are oriental poppies. I can see one that started to emerge, but that's it. But there's loads of heads on there. So again, in the coming days, those will look really lovely. They're called Victoria Louise. They're a big bowl kind of poppy and they return every year and they get bigger every year. And they are, they are massive. They absolutely thrive in this garden. And I'm really glad because they're a plant that I love. Um, unfortunately, they don't flower for too long, but when they do, it's uh, something that's really, really lovely to see. I've also got perennial kale um, in this bed and I just put it here because I didn't know what to do with it but I think it is actually quite nice when you grow it as an ornamental because it has this sort of purpley greeny blue colour which is the colour that I like to um, plant in these borders as you may have noticed um, and also that's kind of matches nicely with the foliage of the um, lamb's ear shrub plants that I grow along the base um, and then obviously the purple of the irises and the blue of the forget-me-nots which are just starting to go over now but really lovely like soft silvers purples and blues in this area um, until the poppies come out and then we get a lot of pink but I like pastel colours and um, I love the colour in this part of the garden. So now I'm going to show you the smaller greenhouse which is just behind this border. Behind me is the smaller greenhouse. Um, again, this was completely empty when we moved in and I built a table and a raised bed. It is quite a shady spot of a garden, so it's prone to slugs. Um, so you need to keep an eye out on your seedlings if you grow them in there. Um, but we grow things in this bed like um, chard really well, it doesn't mind. Um, and we can start our seedlings off here. It's just that they often need to be moved into a uh, sunnier part of the garden, but it does get really warm in here, which is good. Um, it's also a place where I um, start cuttings. So um, I leave my cuttings in a tray of water and they get a lot of warmth in here and I just leave a lid on so that it stays nice and humid. Um, and I have a lot of success in this greenhouse. Um, also, there are a lot of kind of plug plants that I'm trying to grow on before I plant them around the garden. Um, so it's a little bit of a mismatch of everything, but it's a good working space and we use it a lot. Um, and then on the right hand side of me here this is um a bed full of mixed things that we grow along the edge of the polytunnel these are summer fruiting raspberry canes and i train them in kind of these arch shapes and then that means we get a lot of um, upwards growth in the summer months and you can see the bees love them as well so that's a really good thing to see and then underneath uh, we grow all sorts of different things we've got some tulips sometimes we grow cauliflowers cabbages we've got a rhubarb in there um, the tulips are just finishing now. We've got some strawberry plants and we've also got some hollyhocks. So 
and a blueberry bush, a massive mix of things in there. But that's my favorite way to grow things. It feels quite exciting and you have to rummage through and find things. And um, generally you find you get less pests and disease if you grow a mix of different plants in a, in a kind of close together space rather than like monocropping. Um, so that's the idea. It's a little bit weedy at the moment. I'll probably have to pull out some of the bindweed, but um, it's a really useful um, growing space. And it's so small, it makes you think about how much food you can grow in a small raised bed. Next, I'm going to show you the polytunnel, which you can see behind this raised bed. So let's go and take a look in there. So you can tell it's raining now and you can hear that on the polytunnel. So it's a good time to have a look around in here. Again, this is something I would say is a work in progress. Um, and what I wanted to achieve with this space was have things in here that would stay permanently. So we have now got a cherry tree. Um, we've got some lemon trees. We've got um, a pomegranate tree um, and we did have a peach tree, but sadly it died. Um, We've also got loads of chamomile, um, which is a perennial and it's just spreading and it will return every year. But I wanted again to make this just a mixed space where there's always something in the ground. Um, before I started planting perennials in here, everything that we grew was treated as an annual and then disposed of. And there wasn't a lot, of hit, lot growing in here in the winter. Um, so I'm working on it, but it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, I don't think we'll have any harvests off the cherry tree this year. It doesn't look like there's any on there. Um, not sure about the pomegranate either because this is my first time growing um, a pomegranate. It looks like it may have flowered so maybe we'll get some fruit. We'll see later on in the year. We've also got um, some potatoes which look like they're just starting to flower so hopefully we can pull those out soon. Um, these potatoes were actually my Christmas potatoes and I planted them last year in the hope that we could dig them out to eat for Christmas dinner. Um, nothing happened to them over winter, so I assumed that the rats and the mice and the badgers had eaten the seed potatoes, because that does happen a lot, um, but they haven't. And they've just started appearing as like first or second early, so that's fine. We'll dig them up later and see if we've got anything from them. But it's a little bit annoying because I had assumed that they'd all disappeared and then planted things on top of them. And now they've all popped up and I'm probably gonna have to dig the space um, where I've planted things like melons, carrots, parsley, um, we've got peas, and there's just potatoes everywhere. So <laughs> it's a bit of a nightmare at the moment, but um, once we've got those potatoes out, then it should be a better blank canvas for um, arranging the, the food that we're gonna grow in here this year. Um, I do also have some tomatoes in here, but my tomatoes have been absolutely pathetic this year. Last year I had an incredible year for them and I think this year I probably sowed them a bit too early and maybe the seedlings got too cold and kind of gave up. Um, so they've all survived, but they're just really, really small. Um, I've started potting some of them on and planting them out. We'll just probably get a late harvest this year, but I have a lot of envy of people that I know that are growing tomatoes and have now got signs of fruit on their plants already, whereas our plants are like, this big they're really pathetic um, but you can't win everything every year it's last year we had such a good year for them it kind of balances it out in a way and then obviously the peas are doing really well um, I always try and grow peas just to fix the soil because they um, add a bit of nitrogen into the soil and they um, get a lot of their nutrients from the air rather than the soil so they don't deplete the soil um, so I just grow them in between planting other things um, and they're also one that I save the seeds myself and replant them so we never need to buy new seeds we just let the um, let some of the pea pods dry out at the end of the season and then we'll use those again next year. Um, cauliflowers I need to pick <laughs> and I keep putting it off because we have so many cauliflowers but I'm going to do that today because um, they're starting to bolt now um, which happens to me every time I grow cauliflower I notice that it's the perfect time to pick it and then I wait and wait and it starts going to flower um, that's something that I really need to stop doing but um, we'll pick those today um, and I think that concludes more or less the polytunnel um, Again, think of this as a work in progress. It will be a lot more exciting, hopefully in a couple of months time. So I'll show you again in a future video. Um, I reckon we should probably maybe call it a day there because of the rain. What do you do think? A quick speed run. We'll do a really quick look around the rest of the garden, but it is starting to rain quite heavily. I don't want to get the camera wet. So walk and point us. <laughs> I'm going to walk really quickly and point at things. Uh, let's go and have a look at the vegetable garden. OK, 
okay <laughs> vegetable garden. We've got six raised beds. Uh, we're working on clearing the pathways between them. We're also gonna raise the height of the beds. I talk about this area a lot in my other videos, so I'll link to some videos so you can kind of click on those and get a better um, impression of this area. But we've got things going on here. We've got strawberries, asparagus, onions, garlic, which I can pick the scapes, elephant garlic, um, blueberry bushes, perennial kale, loads of lovely things. Um, let's quickly go and look at the orchard next. So at the top of the garden we have this orchard and we let this go really overgrown and wild and you might be able to see even though it's raining there are still quite a lot of pollinators flying around, lots of insects up here. I know we get badgers, we get foxes, mice, voles, all sorts of things. Um, so this is a really lovely wild area and we get a lot of apples and pears and figs from the trees that we grow here. Um, again, this is an area that you'll probably see a lot in my other videos, so I'm not too worried about not being able to show you it completely now. Um, but a lot of these trees were here when we moved in. We added a couple of them um, in, the, in the last three years, but we haven't done too much to this space. So if we walk up through the orchard, I'll very quickly show you the last part of the garden. So this will be our most overgrown part of the garden, but behind me are our compost bins. We've got three, um, one's made of a really big pallet and then a couple of pop-up um, compost bins that we built when we moved in. We've also got a pond here and when the ducks are allowed out in the garden, we do let them have a swim up here and they absolutely love it. And then we've also got some random overgrown <laughs> trees in the background. And this will be probably the last bit of the garden that we ever get to in terms of updating because it's so far away from the house. And uh, we already get a lot of use from this space from using it as a pond and a compost area. Maybe one day we'll make it a little bit more jazzy, but at the moment it's just another kind of wild area. Um, so that's pretty much all of our garden. I hope you've enjoyed this tour. And if you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I'll look forward to showing you more progress as we develop the garden over the coming years.